This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for September 21st, 2022. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, it's been a while since we've discussed the dynamics of transmission and how transmission actually occurs. I realize that there's a reason for this. It's very difficult to study it directly, but we do have hundreds of millions of individual observations. So with all of that, what have we learned? Steve, let me start with two things. First, this is a respiratory virus, and it seems to spread like other respiratory viruses, other viruses that infect the upper airways. Like these other viruses, transmission of SARS-CoV-2 can be very effectively blocked with masks and somewhat less so by distancing. The transmission we've seen over the course of the epidemic has mostly been driven by human behaviors. When there were lockdowns and widespread use of social measures, transmission was decreased. In fact, there are places where transmission was blocked entirely. We still see these sorts of measures being taken in places like China with some apparent success. The second is that vaccination, which was highly effective at decreasing transmission, at least for symptomatic disease, became considerably less effective with time. There have been various measures of the efficacy of vaccination in preventing transmission. I'd say it's very difficult to accurately measure this, but it's fair to say at this point, vaccines aren't playing a big role in blocking transmission. So, Eric, I think you raise several important concepts, and I think we have to think about biology versus behavior. And I mean that the asymptomatic nature of many infections, particularly early in infection, is a very important parameter that makes it difficult to identify and therefore control and limit transmission. Obviously, behavior, if one is not exposed, one cannot get infected, and that's where the barrier and distancing maneuvers are important. This speaks to then other important parameters, which have to do with the pathogen and the immune response. And in particular, with the pathogen, its ability to transmit freely and quietly really can accelerate its ability to spread broadly. And this then intersects with how we optimize our behaviors to minimize transmission. So we've observed a lot over the last two years, and Steve, as you say, in hundreds of millions of individual cases, but we still are struggling with really understanding how transmission occurs and therefore how best do we abrogate it. So we don't know how to make a perfect vaccine, but what can we gather from what we've seen so far? We've really only seen one period when there was a clear effect of vaccination on transmission. This is very early after the introduction of the first mRNA vaccines, when they appeared to almost completely block infection. I should be drawing a better distinction here between infection and transmission. Certainly, if there's no infection, there can't be transmission. So the two are very closely related to one another. Though one can imagine that a vaccine might not have as profound an effect on infection as it does on transmission. So let's go back to the vaccines. Why were they so good? The answer is we don't know. Certainly part of it was that there was a very good match between the circulating virus and the vaccines, but the vaccines also induced very high levels of immunity that declined over time. This was most easily measured by looking at serum antibodies that declined steadily over time. One hypothesis is that very high and well-matched titers are important. We might get a chance to see if this is true as we see the effects of the newer vaccines that are more closely related to the current circulating strains. So Eric, I think the matching of the vaccine to the circulating strain is a very important principle and concept. We deal with that every year with influenza. And early in the COVID pandemic, this was obviously an important factor as the virus had jumped species was learning how to transmit more efficiently in humans. So the virus in itself is learning and adapting and changing. And I think that's part of what we've observed over the last year with new variants. But getting back to early in the pandemic two years ago, what we saw with the early vaccine strain that was well-matched was that it blocked infection. And in those who became infected, the viral load was substantially lower, several logs lower, than those who were vaccinated and became infected, all suggesting decrease in ability to transmit. 
although direct transmission studies are incredibly difficult to do, given the many variables we've already alluded to. But I think what's gone on over the last two years is the virus itself has figured out how to better transmit among people. We don't fully understand the implications of the viral mutations, but what we do know is its efficiency in being able to transmit, such as with Omicron, which only emerged in November of last year, and within a month or two, rapidly spread globally in a much more efficient manner than its predecessor. And now we have additional variants, descendants of Omicron, BA4, BA5, among several others, that have been able to transmit very effectively. So it's not just the matching of the vaccine, the immunogen to the pathogen, but we also have to remember that the pathogen is figuring out how to do its business better. And I would argue its business is not to make us sick. Its business is to transmit silently and efficiently so it's able to reproduce and spread more widely. That means in many of us, we do become sick. So that's an incredibly important parameter that we have to continue to monitor and learn how to better treat. But we shouldn't confuse the issue of the virus is trying to figure out how to, from an evolutionary standpoint, be more fit in how it transmits. I think that's a great point, Lindsay. The evolution of the virus is being driven by transmission. We, of course, care about illness, but the virus probably doesn't care about illness, except for the fact that transmission might rely on some of the symptoms that we develop. For example, coughing, sneezing, upper respiratory symptoms are probably the ways that the virus transmits most effectively. So there is some tie to illness, but causing severe illness and death is probably not helpful for viral transmission. So many physicians have seen cases where some members of a household get COVID and others never develop symptoms. Conversely, we've all heard of events where there were very high attack rates. So why is transmission so inconsistent? It's a great question, Steve. We've all heard about the weddings where lots of people got infected. And in fact, I just came from a scientific conference which had very high attack rates. Transmission is complicated. It's really tied to two factors. For an individual, The probability of that particular host getting infected when exposed is dictated in part by their immunity and by the total exposure of that individual to the virus. We can't really measure exposure, but some of the unusual high transmission events suggest that there must be exposure to a lot of virus. One way this could happen is when virus is aerosolized, meaning it's dispersed into very small droplets. These tiny droplets can remain suspended in the air for extended periods of time, and could potentially avoid filtration by standard masks. And we've seen examples of that early on in the epidemic when there was air blowing through a restaurant and suggestion that people downstream of that airflow were getting infected. But it also can happen because an infected patient aerosolizes effectively when coughing or sneezing because of lots of viral shedding. A corollary of this is seen in tuberculosis, where those with TB of the larynx can be super spreaders because of the location and nature of the infection, which results in high degrees of aerosolization. Eric, I think aerosol versus droplet transmission is quite complex and challenging to study, especially in normal social circumstances. So one needs to carefully understand scientifically how a pathogen is able to transmit through the air. But there also is a receiver part of this, meaning the susceptibility of the individual. And here, there are differences in receptor densities in the upper airway or lower airway. What I mean by that, if we think about the ACE2 receptor or the Tempris 2 receptor as well, one needs to think carefully about what is the density of that in the area where the virus may land. And some of the biology of this we have windows into with children having different densities of these receptors, particularly the ACE2 in their airways compared to adults. Individuals who have had airway injury, such as smoking or other lung injury, may also change the density of receptors, which can impact the susceptibility for acquisition. So I think it's both the pathogen as well as the behavior, as you pointed out, airflow, 
and the host in terms of the receptors and their presence in the upper and lower airways and how this may impact transmission. And some illness may be due to greater densities of receptors or the ability of the pathogen to bind to the lower airway better than the upper airway. So there's a lot in here that we have to understand biologically, but it is the pathogen, the behavior, as well as the host that may impact transmissibility. So given all of this, how can we effectively decrease transmission? I suspect there are two ways. We've discussed in the past the possibility of developing better vaccines that can effectively block infection. We don't know if this is possible, but if it is, it would very much change our approach. For now, though, there doesn't seem to be much of an appetite for requiring social measures again in most communities. So the best an individual can do is to gauge their own tolerance of risk and, if they'd like, take these measures on their own. So, Steve and Eric, I think this is complicated, as we all understand. You know, as we think about developing better vaccines, there are aspects of the biology that we have to reflect on. We've discussed before the issue of compartment biology. What is the immunology systemically and the immunology in the site of contact with the organism, the mucosa, the upper respiratory tract? And we have to think about, do we develop better tools like vaccines that can elicit a stronger immune response where we are likely to become into contact with the pathogen, COVID. And I think what we may be seeing is that vaccines work very well to protect the systemic compartment, which is what's related to the illness that brings us to the hospital, but clearly are not working well in the mucosal compartment, which is likely highly related to transmissibility. And that is an area that we have to better define mucosal immunity and how to elicit it in a strong way that is resident and present at the moment of contact and doesn't take a week or two to emerge because that would defeat the purpose of decreasing transmission. There also is the issue of the insert. What is it that we want the immune response to respond to so that we have the appropriate protection for the organism that is circulating. We see this in the modifications of the vaccine, as we've talked about in terms of matching from the ancestral strain to the beta, to the delta, to the Omicron BA1, to the Omicron BA45. And in the last week, we published data, of which I'm a co-author, looking at the immune responses elicited by an Omicron-based vaccine and being able to see that it can elicit equivalent, if not better, immune responses against new variants. Whether those in vitro data correlate with protection is what we have to see with carefully done clinical studies. But I think, Steve, a critical element is understanding strong immunity in the compartment of contact and understanding what the right immunogen is so the immunity is appropriate for the assaulting pathogen. Lindsay, one hopes that these better matches will work, but of course, at this point, we only have the kinds of in vitro data that you just described. So how well that will correlate with blocking infection, we don't know yet. We'll see. I remain concerned, though, that systemic responses, which are induced by the kinds of vaccines that we're using right now, may not be adequate for preventing infection. So Eric, I think you're absolutely correct that we need to understand what protection looks like and for what outcome. And I think decreasing or blocking transmission is incredibly important and is something to strive for. Being able to prevent severe illness is of paramount import. And it does look like our current vaccines, let alone the newer vaccines, still remain highly effective at preventing severe illness. So we should be proud of that achievement while we strive to understand how to block transmission, which I think requires substantially more investigation and defining of the biology for us to be able to truly block transmission, given its complexities, as we have discussed. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.